Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Baltzell. I'm the statewide salmon and steelhead manager for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. I want to welcome you to this evening's North of Falcon meeting. Uh, this evening, we're going to be mostly focusing on uh, coastal and straits uh, freshwater fisheries, as well as Puget Sound marine area fisheries. Uh, with me on screen tonight is uh, Dr. Kirsten Simonson, who's going to be giving a majority of our presentation. Uh, and we also have other staff on the line to help answer questions as we go through the evening. Uh, before we get started here, just a few uh, meeting uh, logistics here on the, the front side. Uh, we're going to keep folks muted during the meeting. Uh, but if you have questions or uh, other uh, things you want to raise, you can uh, do uh, the raised hand feature, which is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, for those people who are on the phone tonight, you can also uh, press star nine, and that will raise your hand. Also, when we call on you, if you're on your phone, star six allows you to unmute yourself on the, on the line. Uh, just uh, again, reminders for everybody, uh, we're here to talk about salmon season settings and what potential seasons might be and take your feedback on proposed seasons and any modifications moving through the North of Falcon season setting process. Uh, just a reminder, uh, we want you to be tough on issues and questions, but not on people or organizations. We ask that you refrain from personal attacks and insults and threats. Uh, obviously, we want everybody to listen and be respectful of each other. And we're trying to allow for a balance of speaking time. We've given ourselves two hours to be together tonight, and hopefully we'll be able to get through all the material and answer people's questions in that amount of time. Uh, and just a reminder for everybody, we are also recording this meeting tonight. It will be available through our YouTube channel and on our website uh, as soon as tomorrow morning. So uh, once again, thanks for being with us. Next slide. So again, this is the Puget Sound Coastal and Freshwater Recreational Discussion. Uh, just uh, some of the stuff we're going to roll through tonight. Uh, when I hand it over to Kirsten, we're going to go through some Puget Sound and coastal forecasts and trends. We're going to go through management objectives for both Chinook and Coho fisheries in Puget Sound, uh, recreational fisheries in Puget Sound, as well as uh, uh, coastal uh, freshwater management objectives. Uh, we'll talk, walk through some of the modeling that has occurred to date. Uh, we'll talk about different considerations for both the marine area fisheries and the freshwater fisheries. And then the bulk of our time tonight will be to take your public comment on these fisheries uh, proposals and uh, take into consideration other proposals for shaping as we go forward in the North of Falcon process. Next slide, Kirsten. So real quick, uh, for those who are new to the process, uh, have never been through this before, North of Falcon is the annual cooperative process to set salmon seasons in Washington waters. The name, uh, North, uh, the name North of Falcon, excuse me, comes from the waters north of Oregon's Cape Falcon, which marks the southern border of our management of salmon stocks in Washington. This North of Falcon process is part of a larger salmon setting process that involves state, tribal governments, federal regulators, and representatives from other US states and Canada. As part of our North of Falcon process, uh, we also, it's part of a larger rulemaking process for salmon seasons within Washington. Our rulemaking processes and procedures are uh, guided by the Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, a graphic of that process is on the screen here. In early January, we filed our CR 101 as part of that process, which is our uh, publishing our intent to modify rules in relation to the, these salmon seasons. The middle where you see that arrow right now is the North of Falcon process where we take your input on proposed seasons and craft fisheries uh, along the coast and in Puget Sound and the Columbia River that meet all our management objectives, uh, ESA restrictions, uh, and co-manager agreements. After we get through that North of Falcon process, we will uh, shape our rules package and file our CL 102 take additional public comment and hold public hearings as part of that rule package, and then move that through the process where by the end of June, uh, we present a rule package to the director for his signature. 
So with that, uh, I would like to hand the microphone over to Kirsten Simonson. Uh, she's our recreational fisheries manager for Puget Sound Salmon Fisheries. Uh, she's gonna guide you through a majority of the presentation tonight. Uh, we're gonna hear from other staff as well. So thank you, Kirsten. Thanks, Mark. Um, so just to kind of go through a quick recap of some of the forecasts that we've seen, uh, for those of you who've been attending North of Falcon meetings this year, this is going to be a bit of a review. Uh, so just uh, to briefly summarize, Puget Sound Chinook, uh, the natural stocks are down about 36% um, as compared to the most recent 10-year average. Um, hatchery stocks are up about 6% from the most recent 10-year average. Uh, for Puget Sound Coho, natural stocks are up about 29% and hatchery stocks are up about 61% from the, the most recent 10-year average. Um, and this is kind of a, a rebounding from some poor years in 2015, 16, and 17. Uh, Puget Sound Chum, the natural stocks are down about 61% and hatchery stocks are still down about 64% from the most recent 10-year average. So kind of breaking it down into some more specific areas, uh, this is a just kind of a, a comparison between last year and this year of um, summer, fall Chinook's natural stocks, and you can see they're up about 7% from last year. We look at the spring natural stocks um, up about 28% from last year. Looking at hatchery stocks um, up, up overall about 8% from last year. And then finally for hatchery spring stocks about dead even with last year. Looking at the coho forecasts, um, natural stocks are up about 9% as compared to last year. A couple of areas to point out here, you'll notice the spots of red are in the South Sound um, and Hood Canal, and these are areas that we're going to be keeping an eye on for coho. Um, more pertaining to this talk tonight is uh, to keep an eye on that Hood Canal stock. Um, and the hatchery stocks, um, again, about up about 8% from last year. Two areas of concern, things that we're keeping an eye on are both the Stillaguamish and the Snohomish hatchery stocks. So if we look at the uh, the North Coast forecast comparisons, you could see the Hill River uh, forecasts on the top panel and the Quail Ute on the bottom. Um, if we look at Chinook, uh, the wild, uh, sorry, fall Chinook are up slightly from last year, uh, while spring Chinook are down slightly from last year, um, and wild fall Coho in the Hill are up from last year. Uh, if we move to the Quail Ute, you could see that they're pretty much on par with last year, not very similar forecasts uh, for Chinook from last year. Uh, for Coho, we can look at, if we look at the summer Coho for both hatchery and wild, uh, they are up, but we are keeping an eye on those. That's always a big conservation concern, so we are keeping an eye on those numbers. Um, and both hatchery and wild fall Coho are also up on the Quail Ute. So we look at some recent trends. This is Quill Ute Summer Coho. You can see how they've been trending over the last several years. Um, and you can see that escapement is in the blue line and the run size is in orange. And so you can see how that compares in recent trends. Uh, if we look at the Quill Ute Fall Coho, this is a trend for uh, Quill Ute Fall Coho. You can see the escapement again in blue, the run size in orange. Um, and you can see the escapement goals, the both low and high escapement goals plotted here as well. And finally, if we look at the Ho spring and summer Chinook, you can see the trends here as well. Uh, the, you can see the escapement goal uh, posted here as well. And again, escapement is in blue and the run size is in orange. So if we move back into the Puget Sound area, you can look at the, this is a, a figure of the uh, Chinook management objectives for Puget Sound. Um, and again, for those of you who have been um, attending these meetings. This is not going to be a surprise. This is going to be kind of a, a bit of a review. Uh, just a couple things to point out here. The ones that are highlighted, particularly Nooksack Spring, Stillaguamish, Snohomish, and then Nisqually and Skokomish, uh, these are all stocks where we're currently, the current planned season is not meeting the management objectives. So we're currently above where we should be on these ones. So this, these are stocks that we're going to be keeping an eye on. We look at the coho management objectives. Um, you can see there's a couple of, of stocks here that are uh, have stars next to them. And these are in particular the straight stocks, which are currently still under a rebuilding plan. Hood Canal coho is currently in an overfished status. So this is one that's gonna come into play this year for the management season. And then finally, Snohomish. Uh, Snohomish coho have been under a rebuilding plan um, and are managed to a minimum escapement target of 55,000. And so this is one that's still under a rebuilding plan. So moving up to the North Coast again to look at the Chinook and Coho management objectives. Most of these stocks are managed to an escapement goal. 
Um, and so you can see what the guidelines here are listed for uh, quail ute summer Chinook, uh, for natural fall Chinook, for ho spring, summer, and fall Chinook. Um, and then looking at Solduck natural summer coho, there is currently no goal established, and this is still an uh, ongoing discussion with co-managers. Um, and then you can see quail ute natural coho and ho natural coho on the bottom with the escaping goals. So moving into some of the Puget Sound proposed seasons for right now, uh, this is kind of the initial uh, matrix for the, the current, the upcoming season. Um, so these will be posted on the website very soon. Uh, unfortunately, we just got these materials put together uh, recently, so they were not made available uh, before tonight's meeting, So, but they will be made available very soon. So you can kind of take a look and see what the initial proposed season is for Puget Sound for this year. Um, and I'll just kind of step through, um, as we're talking through this, I'll kind of step through a couple of the big changes that we see. Um, areas five and six, not really any big changes in terms of Chinook. Um, area seven, uh, we're moving it to, uh, the proposed, proposal on the table now is to move it to an August 15th start. Um, and we do have a February black mouth season planned. For area nine, uh, that's moving back to an August one start. For area 10, the black mouth season will be in February only to coincide with that area seven. Area 11 is moving to a June one start. And in areas 12 and 13, there's no major changes planned as of right now. So moving to coho, we take a look at the matrix that is proposed for now. And you can see a couple of those changes that I just mentioned are reflected here as well. So I will point out that the modeling for coho is not currently finalized. So there's a, a fair bit of things that could change. However, all of our planned seasons right now do meet conservation objectives for coho. So for areas five and six, no major changes. Um, for area seven, this is again, moving to an August 15 start. And this will be a mark selective fishery. For area nine, it's an August one start. For area 10, no big change. For area 11, a June one start. And for areas 12 and 13, again, no change. Um, I'm gonna turn it over briefly to Mark Downen to run through the Hood Canal uh, proposal. Thanks, Kirsten. Yes, this is Mark Downen, um, District Fish Biologist for Hood Canal in the Eastern Straits. And I'm just gonna give a brief overview of the freshwater opportunities that we're planning here in the canal. Um, they look very similar to what we've had in the last few years. So uh, we've got a coho fishery in the Big Quilcene River um, that runs from August 16th through to, to, um, October 31st. Limit of four coho, anti-snagging rule. We do have a fisheries conflict issue that's been ongoing at the Rogers Street access um, for a number of years now. And we are considering alternating days um, with the tribal fishery there or possibly moving the non-treaty closure boundary upstream slightly from Rogers Street. So those are a couple of issues um, or that's an issue and a couple of possible solutions that are on the table for discussion with the co-managers. We have our chum fisheries in the Dosi Wallops and the Ducka Bush, um, both of those run from November 1st through the 15th of December. Um, fall chum, um, those are bright fish entering the river. Um, it's a nice little boutique fishery, doesn't get a lot of pressure, limit two fish. We expect those to go on um, as they have in the last several years um, here in 2022. Um, I do want to say something about some of the recent closures that we've had. Some of these closures have become quite extended, but um, they come up in the public comments. And so I'm just going to run through them very quickly. Uh, the first is the Skokomish River. This year, we are at this time planning to be closed for salmon. This ongoing issue is um, the reservation boundary dispute that has not been resolved. And we don't have agreement with the Skokomish tribe to have a freshwater fishery there for Chinook salmon or coho and fall, fall chum. The other two systems um, on the Kitsap Peninsula, the Tahuya River and the Dewata River have both in the past provided some um, decent opportunity for coho fishing in, in freshwater, but we have had serious private property issue um, concerns with the Tahuya River where um, 
degradation to the riverbanks and the um, and the trash has become excessive and the private property owner had asked us to close that. So that has been closed due to lack of access. It doesn't help um, the situation that the coho and hood canal are in overfish status and I did want to also mention that we have a very low forecast and even though we're in the low abundance threshold, um, which is just above critical, we do have concerns that that forecast could be on the high side and we could actually be um, very near the criti critical abundance threshold. Uh, moving on to the Duado River, um, we've got summer chum issues there. Um, we have a very imperiled population of summer chum um, that's been deemed necessary for recovering that population. And it's just been an ongoing issue having anglers walking across the reds that have been laid down just prior um, to the opening of that fishery. So that has um, been closed as well and at this time is, is, is intended to remain closed. So that's really the uh, synopsis from Hood Canal. Thanks, Mark. So just some considerations for the 2022 salmon season that we are that we see. Um, forecasts for Puget Sound, Chinook, and Coho stocks are uh, modestly improved over recent years, but obviously there's still some concerns. Uh, Chinook stocks continue to be depressed relative to their status at listing and are designated in crisis in the state of the salmon report in 2020. Um, so I mentioned earlier that some of the stocks are still depleted from their 10 year average um, and they're furthermore they're still depleted from at the time of listing in 1999. Uh, there are low expected returns of natural Chinook to both the Stillaguamish and the Snohomish rivers and these are going to come into uh, play for this year for sure. There are low expected returns of natural coho in the South Sound, Hood Canal and the Strait of Juan de Fuca stocks. Uh, there is potential to have both the Cretes and those Snohomish stocks reach rebuilt, so there is some good news coming up this year as well. Uh, chum stocks returning to South Sound and Hood Canal are similar to 2021, and we also have continued concerns for uh, Southern resident killer whales. So we heard a lot of suggestions from the public uh, for coastal freshwater regulations, um, and so I just wanted to kind of mention a couple of those uh, that we've received and wanted to highlight. Uh, we've heard to prioritize time on the water over a larger bag limit. Uh, we've heard to consider a one and done rule for all fall fisheries on the Ho River, the Bogachill, the uh, Kalo, and the, and the Dickey, and allow that one fish to be wild or hatchery, Chinook or Coho. Uh, we've heard that bait is important to the spring fishery, uh, spring Chinook fishery on the Solduck. Uh, we heard to restore the August 1st through September 15th season on, on the Quileute. We've heard to extend the coho season on the Solduck and the Dungeness through December. And finally, we've heard to allow retention of hatchery salmon during game fish openings. Uh, so we have made note of these and they will be considered uh, for the, throughout the season as we're planning uh, for the season. So continuing to take comments and uh, we appreciate that. So uh, just some 2022 considerations for the North Coast Rivers. Uh, for the Ho River, wild spring and sh summer Chinook, the forecast uh, is 696 and the escapement goal is 900. So this is falling under the challenge category. Uh, for wild fall Chinook, the, the uh, escapement goal is 60% of the run size. Um, so you can see that the harvestable is about uh, 1,354 fish. For wild fall coho, the escapement goal is between two and 5,000. Um, and you can see that the ocean, uh, the ocean age three forecast is 46.79, so it's less uh, to the terminal run. So there's about 2,000 that are harvestable. So more considerations for the Quileute system. You can see wild fall Chinook. The forecast is about uh, a little over 7,600. The escapement's goal is about 60% of the run size. Uh, for wild summer Chinook, the forecast is uh, just shy of 1,100, and the escapement guideline is 1,200. So this is going to be a challenge. For hatchery spring Chinook, you see that the forecast is just shy of 3,000. Uh, the broodstock needs are between six and 900. For wild fall coho, the uh, Ocean Age 3 forecast is uh, just about a little over 12,000, so uh, less than that to the river. Uh, the escapement goal is between 6,300 and over 15,000. So <laughs> that's one that we're keeping an eye on, um, although it's still about 4,000 harvestable. 
Um, hatchery fall coho, the forecast for ocean age three is over 20,000 and the broodstock goal is about 600. For wild summer coho, the forecast for ocean age three is a little over 900. Um, the escapement goals um, are, are somewhere between 800 and 1300 fish needed to the spawning grounds. This is gonna be a challenge. And finally, the hatchery summer coho, the Ocean Age 3 forecast is about 4,600 and the broodstock needs are about 150. So just to kind of move through to the, uh, the next couple steps for the North Falcon process, again, all this information is available on our website. Um, tonight, we're having the North Coast and Straits discussion, which you're all currently a part of. Uh, tomorrow, there's a discussion on Willapa Bay fisheries. Um, coming up on Monday, there's another Puget Sound Recreational Fisheries discussion that will include a lot of the freshwater um, as well. Next week, we move into North of Falcon number two. And then in early April, there are both a Willapa Bay and a Grace Harbor fisheries discussions before we have the final uh, PFMC Council meeting in early April. And with that, we'll open it up to questions. Thanks, Kirsten. Uh, appreciate the presentation. So just a reminder for everybody, uh, if you have a question or want to provide comment about anything you heard tonight, uh, there's a raised hand feature at the bottom of your screen, depending on your Zoom version. Uh, if you're on the phone tonight, uh, go ahead and use star nine uh, to raise your hand. And Leah will uh, call on folks as uh, you raise your hand. We'll, we'll take questions and, and comments in order. And, and I think looks like we've left ourselves plenty of time to, to go through stuff and, and answer questions tonight. So uh, Leah, whenever anybody's ready, uh, fire away. So it looks like we have our first hand from Gabe. Gabe, I have enabled you to unmute. Yeah, thanks. Uh, do we have any steelhead impacts left from winter steelhead to be able to access those spring Chinook on the sole duck? Uh, great question, Gabe. I don't have a specific answer, but I think we might have some staff on the line that, that might be able to answer that. Hey, Gabe, that's a good question. Um, so you're bringing up a bigger topic here that uh, salmon management here overlaps with um, some of the steelhead management goals that it sounds like you've been tracking. So as you know, um, pre-season, with the forecast we had in place focused around steelhead, um, it looked like we did have steelhead on the Quileute, you know, which supports the tributary sole duck that you referenced. Um, as maybe you know, we had some in-season changes to the rules because it looked to us like, and the tribe, like the forecast was coming in much lower. The run size was coming in much lower than forecasted. So we won't know, kind of have the final number on what the ultimate run size was, you know, until uh, middle of summer or fall. Um, but we're tracking that right now. And it looks like um, the run size is, in fact, you know, coming in um, significantly lower than expected. All that said, um, one of the slides, so, so I guess I'm trying to separate steelhead and salmon here, focus on the salmon management piece. Um, we saw a slide here that talked about um, potential options and forecasts for spring Chinook, um, summer Chinook in the Quileute River. Um, Jenny that manages those fisheries and I have been talking about those and it looks like if you open your pamphlet or you look at the rules that were in place last year, um, the forecast this year around Chinook um, will most likely support those. But if you remember, we had a closure for sole duck summer coho last year. That also impacts the Chinook fishery, um, as you may know, because those overlap. So what we're trying to do is carve out a fishery this year that allows us to fish during that coho time period, maximize um, opportunity on those Chinook while still protecting the coho. So a lot of moving pieces there, mixed species. Um, I think the best thing for us to do is focus right now on the salmon fisheries and see if we can expand those from last year, particularly into the summer coho period. So I just wanna give you a chance for a follow-up there cause I kind of threw a lot, lot out there. So um, does that help? No. Yeah, that helps. So um, we're not gonna be limited by steelhead on prosecuting that spring Chinook fishery. Is that a fair assumption? It is, but if I'm being really honest and I, I think it'd be unfair for me to say 
you know, that the Chinook fishery is not going to be limited because we know these early season steelhead closures keep us off the water on some of those early season Chinook fisheries, but we're targeting an opening, an opener like we had last year. So, so the short answer is yes. I think that's a, that's a fair assumption. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And our next hand is from Kurt. Kurt, I have allowed you to unmute. You got me? I um, got you, Kurt. Having lived on the other side of the salmon game fish uh, controversy for some time, I have a couple questions about the salt duck. I don't really fish it so much. I'm, this is just for my edification, I guess. Is, is those salt duck, are those spring shooks mostly hatchery or wild? Yeah, so I'm going to let jenny jump in because that changes from year to year kurt and we got to remember we're talking spring and summer chinook and people can get you know a little bit tied around the axle on which we're talking about hi kurt good to hear you good to see you jenny yeah you too um so for this year the uh cool you um uh wild run is uh forecast to be 1096 we, our escapement guideline is 1200. So we're below where we want to be, you know, before any fishing. Uh, the fishing is mark selective. Uh, we are expecting about uh, 2,955 hatchery spring summer fish. Um, so I think uh, sport fisheries could take, you know, maybe, uh, well, the, the average catch over recent years varies quite a bit, but you know, six or 700 is probably a reasonable estimate. So it's a little bit mixed. It's both. There's, there's hatchery and wild springers. But, but the, the fishery is to target the hatchery fish? Yeah, that's correct. So we're looking at uh, prosecuting a, a fishery targeting hatchery fish at the expense of a wild resource? Well. Or potentially ex expense of the wild resource? uh if we're releasing the wild fish uh then well, we remember have... you're fishing in the spring and a, a significant portion of those wild fish you release will be kelts and if you're using bait the hooking mortality those things skyrocket it goes oh from... i'm i'm sorry you mean steelhead kelts you're talking about the kelts yeah. intercepted in the... well you're know, starting in february so it'll be you know pre pre-spawn and post-spawn steelhead being caught they're all wild fish the steelhead do spawn again the second time and if you use bait you you know the there's lots yeah. of animal information that the number of fish hooked in critical areas with bait um, for kelts versus non-spawn fish is, you know, about a factor of 10. Uh, well, Kurt, what we did last year was we didn't open, uh, so the Springer fishery opened on the Solduck and the Quileute uh, May 1st. And um, so we, and the river clo was closed altogether in April. It is also closed this April to protect spawning steelhead. So it's finding that balance between protecting steelhead and allowing opportunity on spring chinook. Um, are you gonna monitor that fishery in season? With creels? Yes. Mark? Yeah, let me help there, Jenny, cause there is actually a change to that. So I wanna make sure folks are tracking this. Kurt asked a question about uh, spring chinook catcher versus wild. Those are the numbers Jenny provided. The forecast and the run size for steelhead the tail end of the run that Kurt's talking about, you know, that number won't be available till late. Um, but the preseason forecasts and potentially even updates to that are suggesting that we could implement a spring Chinook, summer Chinook fishery uh, May 1. So I just want to make sure all those kind of details were in order there. Um, you know, we have a strong interest in monitoring um, the Quileute River salmon fishery this year. And we've got some money in the budget this year to, to implement that. Uh, the problem is the money becomes available July 1. So we're uh, ramping up our efforts right now to hire um, a limited Creole survey effort on the Quileute. If we're being realistic, that's gonna come into play um, for those fall fisheries. Um, but our hope is to have some long-term effort there in the Quileute focused on Creole. So there's the, the answer for Creel there, Kurt. And I think the short answer is no, we won't have uh, likely monitoring for the summer piece of that fishery. You see my concerns on a look, uh, but apparently is a double standard. If you have a Chinook fishery um, 
game fish impacts become secondary. If you have a game fish in, uh, fishery, then the Chinooks become uh, primary. You know, the, the, there's a, a double standard in how you manage those fisheries. How, have you talked to your steelhead uh, constituents out there and see what they feel about that after the, all what they went through this winter? Yeah, so just so we can keep moving here, I just want to um, flag, Kurt, you're right. We're expecting expecting incidental impacts from the sport fishery targeting salmon um, in the spring summer period. Um, there is an expectation that we will have steelhead impacts associated with those fisheries. So let's be real clear about that. So, um, yep, and, and we're aware of that and it's on the table here. So make sure everybody knows that. Thank you. Yep, thank you. And that was our last hand. If anybody else has a hand, you can uh, has a question or a comment, you can raise your hand at the bottom of your screen. Um, oh, there we go. And we have a question from Bob. Bob, I have allowed you to unmute. Hey guys, thanks. Um, James and Jenny, um, for I know obviously the whole spring chinook fishery looks you know, pretty poor. We've been dealing with that for a bunch of years, so we wouldn't even expect or even talk about an opener for that. But um, in the last couple of years, that's been closed all the way through September 16th. Um, are we going to talk about, is that going to be again this year or will that be open for um, possible summer steelhead, uh, cutthroat, that kind of stuff, um, starting the first, Jan first Saturday in June? Um, is that a possibility in the hoe? Yeah. Hey, Kirsten, um, is there a way you can flip to that, that trend you had for hoe, uh, Chinook? I think it's a nice one. So, cause we're bouncing around from river and species. And so it's nice for folks to remember what we're talking about. Um, so this is the one Bob, and by the way, hi, Bob, I'm going to see you on here. Thanks for jumping yep. on. Um, yes. Yeah, so this is the run Bob's talking about, low abundance, like Bob said, we've seen this for a number of years. Um, I think the question there about could we have some kind of limited fishery in the presence of those fish during the summer, game fish, something like that. I just put it on the notes here that you said June 1, so maybe you let Jenny and I regroup on that, and of course with the co-managers, and um, Jenny, I don't think we would say that that's not a, an idea to put on the table, right? him finally being a father. That is absolutely an idea to put on the table. Great. Thanks. Perfect. And then the other question I had was regarding those summer cohos. It's a March select fishery now. And we we plan on last couple of years we've gone to no bait um July 15. Um having the no bait in there does that change anything with us the possibility of us trying to target those hatchery the summer hatchery cohos that are coming back um with obviously limited i mean i understand the the wild ones are not quite where we want them but they're not as bad as they have were last year um instituting some kind of fishery in there and not having that august or that july 15th to september 15th closure um, like we had last year, um, if there's any way we can instrument a some form of attack at those hatchery fish, which are in large abundance uh, in this forecast. Yeah, I just made a note of that one too, Bob. And the way you described the summer, the wild summer coho run as not where we want it, but bigger than last year, I think is a good way to describe it. Last year, we had about 300. We were extremely worried that fishery closed this year we're looking at closer to 800 still below what we would consider a realistic goal but we're working with the co-managers right now to make sure we can manage or implement a responsible fishery limit impact on wild fish access the hatchery one so no bait mark selective would be the type of tool that would get us in there i think um so did i hear all that right yeah, no, you got it. That's perfect. Thank you. And then the last comment I have is regarding our fall Chinook. Um, you know, we're we're better than we were last year. Of course, last year we didn't have wild coves to catch. And so some of those systems probably saw a little more effort. And then, of course, we had to have an emergency closure on our fall Chinook last year at the end there, right? Because they weren't right quite there. So I just want this on the record. 
I have asked and asked and asked, and there's a large support here on the coast for maybe making these river fisheries a, um, you know, like this North Coast thing, like a five fish a year type deal, because they're all wild fish. All of our fall fish are wild in terms of our Chinooks. And um, we've got too many people that are catching way more than, you know, they're catching one every day. They're going out a lot They're catching too many. And our runs really aren't, you know, we're, we're, we're above it a little bit, but we're not far enough above it that I think that we can just have this onslaught of, of killing of those fish. And so I propose that we would go to like some kind of a yearly limit or something on those. We should at least be looking at that down the road. I know we can't do it for this year, but I think it's something that should be discussed. Thanks, Bob. All right, thanks. I agree with all the other salmon fisheries for this year on the coast. Thank you, Bob. And our next question is from, or comment is from Christian. Christian, I've allowed you to unmute. How's it going? Thank you. Can you guys hear me? We got your yeah, question. We can Go hear ahead. You. All right, cool. Um, how's it going, James? To see you there. Um, I guess I had a question and to clear up to what the gentleman asked earlier. From what I understand, the Solduck Springers are, it's like a summer Chinook that reaches into spring but it's not a spring chinook in the sense of the uh like the hoe or the elwa um spring chinook um if that makes sense right yeah that makes sense to me um but there's not like a true early spring wild chinook run on the solar right well i think to maybe dig into all the details um you know christian it's been nice having your engagement over this past year or so with jenny and i I think what might be helpful is if we just shared with you the modeled um, entry timing of these fish and we've got that, you know, handy. So maybe offline we can really dig into when and where those fish show up. Right. Cause every paper says something different. <laughs> yeah. I think Jenny's got some pretty great data with the co-managers to show kind of when we expect to see them and when we don't. And um, so, yeah, let's, let's dig into that later. Um, cool. So somebody mentioned the, the whole, um, fishery for the summer. Um, I'm just curious for, I don't know if you have the exact numbers right here, but it looked like in 2019, we preemptively opened the salmon fishery for June. Like what led, what led y'all to that decision in 2019 where it was even preemptively written in the regs? And um, I'm just curious. Yeah, I'm gonna reach out to Jenny here. So, you know, Jenny's become a, a bit of a historian on what was done in the past as we try to move forward with the solid plan. But I, she's awesome. I was talking to her about numbers and she was just, boom, she's pulling it out of her head. So that was yeah, awesome. but maybe I'm going to, before I say that, Jenny, if you don't have the answer, we can dig in later because I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be able to talk to her later. So, so yeah, I, I guess what I would say is on the Ho River, there are quite a few hatchery uh, springtime fish that come in from other systems. And when, uh, when the wild um, spring numbers are above the escapement goal and there's room for a little bit of impacts on those, it's a nice opportunity to be able to target those hatchery Chinook that are dipping into the hoe from, from those other systems. I don't think we've seen uh, very often in recent years uh, a large enough abundance of wild uh, spring summer hoe Chinook to be able to target them individually. The hatchery fish? The wild fish. But oh, the, the summer wild fish? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you just mean for catch and release. Okay, not for retention. Well, so even catch and release in times where we are below the escapement goal has mortality on those fish. And so having closed salmon fisheries in years where we're not going to meet the escapement goal before we even start, uh, conservation becomes our top concern. When there's some room for being able to harvest those dip in hatchery fish from other systems uh, right. and have some impacts on our wild Chinook, um, acceptable impacts on those fish, I think those are the years where, uh, where a, a springtime Chinook fishery is considered. Okay. And then I guess this next one will roll into it too. So we usually close the first two weeks of September or uh, we emphasize that that's the time the summer Chinook are spawning, correct? Yes. 
have, have we ever thought about, I mean, I don't think anybody's going to have a problem with this, even on the hoe, like right out the gate, just implementing selective gear rules, June 1st, uh, and then considering, I mean, if we're looking at this as a conservation catch and release fishery, I don't think the people who are doing the, thanks, buddy. I don't think the people doing the uh, catch and release are going to be too worried about having to do selective gear rules. Um, you know, we care about these fish. I, I just want to fish for anything, right? I think I told you that the other day. And I, as long as you just keep making it harder, that's what I don't care about. Is when it's when I'm kicked off the river, that's when I get upset. I don't get upset about you guys making it harder um, or trying to take more care of the fish, but. If we really, I, I just, I think we should get into that habit of, of going ahead and, okay, the summer Chinook spawn, you know, the last week of August, first two weeks of September, from here on out, that's just selective gear rules, period. Any of those rivers that are open that there's a hatchery fishery on, you know, we can still harvest those fish, but that's going to be what you have to go through to harvest those fish. And the real anglers are going to go, okay, I have no problem with that. Um, Okay, one, one thing I just want to really clarify is that when a river is close to salmon fishing, it is not open to catch and release salmon fishing. Right, right. But I mean, it happens in general. Um, I mean, I, I'd spent a lot of time on the hoe. I'm not targeting anything last summer, and I caught probably one of every species randomly because um, I don't, I, you know, I don't entirely know that fishery. So I'm just going out there and trying stuff. Um, but I, I know that the selective gear rule is already in place. And then it can like, I think I emailed you, it kind of even highlights the fishery for people. Hey, this is a sensitive fishery. When you're coming here, you need to take extra care. I mean, when I see it in the regs, I already know, hey, that something's going on where I need to take extra care there. Um, and if we really, really want to take care of these fisheries and there's no point of it, you know, I don't see why it, it hurts that, the, so I, I know it's already single point barbless, um, I don't really know other than requiring a knotless net, rubber knotless net, what more it would be. Um, but yeah, I think it would be cool for people to start realizing that there are fish in the river and they're spawning and they need to take extra care during these times. Thanks, Christian. Yeah, appreciate it. Oh, and then the last thing was, how do I get the uh, clear water forecast? Yeah, um, I can get that to you. So we, the way we've divided these up, um, you know, exactly. makes sense for us organization, but um, for you running around fishing a lot of different rivers, um, you need them all. So we got a Grace Harbor public meeting. Uh, I'm Just losing track of time, time, but Mark, I think we had that last night. Or yeah, anyway, these meetings are blending together a little bit, but I'll get you what you need, Christian. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, um, other than that, yeah, I mean, it's really exciting, you know, the potential that the August fishery for fall co or summer co is going to be open. Um, you know, that's, that's like my favorite one. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited. Thank hey, Christian, guys. let me, I don't want to tamper the excitement. Uh, so the goal is to, to, you know, expand on those fisheries from last year, but, um, there's a lot of work to do for Jenny and I to design a fishery that protects summer coho. Uh, right, right. And then that's, yeah, what I, I just want to make sure we're not announcing that that's, that's uh, a done deal, but it's definitely something we're working really hard on. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And our next hand is from Andrew. Andrew, I have allowed you to unmute. Thanks everyone. Uh, so this question is regarding Marine Area 7, um, the proposed opening for Chinook has been pushed back to August 15th, uh, assuming that it's to lower the impact and um, allow us to not eat our quota up as uh, quickly as we did last season. Um, I just wanted to ask a question on whether or not the department is looking, if that will ensure that there's an extended um, salmon fishery for co through the end of the proposed season, um, historically down here in area nine and 10, as we meet our Chinook escapement and the Chinook season's closed, we haven't been at risk of losing that late season fishery for co -op. And just wanted to um, ask if you guys had plans to protect that late season up in the uh, San Juan Islands. Thanks for the question, Andrew. And, and yes, absolutely. That went into our, our thought process and decision-making uh, when, when we put that proposed season out. 
Um, obviously, uh, uh, none of us wants a repeat of what happened to last year's Area 7 season. Uh, I, I don't think I need to repeat it, but I will, that uh, that was an unacceptable outcome for everybody. So what we're trying to do is, is build some more security, I guess, if uh, in a way, uh, into the package that uh, uh, provides a little more certainty towards a, uh, the full fishery that we put on the table um, from the get-go. So, uh, yep, that's exactly where we landed and why we landed on the later season opportunity for Chinook. Um, uh, I would just remi remind everybody and, and folks that this is just an initial proposal. We have received, you know, some uh, some feedback already from, from folks about uh, the season that was put on the table. Uh, and I want to also remind folks that the current proposed package uh, uh, when combined with tribal fisheries still doesn't meet our, our management objectives for this year. So I think what you see in front of you is not a, a finishing point. Um, I think uh, there's, there's still changes to come. So uh, really what we're interested in is what you like and what you don't like about it. So uh, thanks for that question, Andrew. And our next hand is from Tom, Tom, I have allowed you to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you place the uh, summer, uh, excuse me, the Chinook matrix up, please? Sure, no problem. There you go. And so uh, what, it, what I'm seeing here, obviously, and, and one of the things we haven't talked about is uh, the closure of, of Area 9 uh, in July. Um, under this current regime, of a potential August 1st opener, what would the Chinook quota be in Area 9? So uh, I don't have the number in front of me, Tom, but I think it's, as it is modeled right now, it's a little over 4,000 fish uh, was what was on that, that quota for that time period. So I've spent a tremendous amount of time on this, on this fishery. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that I don't believe that in an opener on August 1st, we're gonna get close to 4,000 fish. Area nine's a transitory area. Those fish are moving through there. It's a completely different fishery on August 1st. I'd really like to have you guys consider a July 16th opener in that area. And if we need to shave uh, February in 10 or, or do some other shaping in the winter to achieve that, I would highly encourage you to do so. In addition, we have an upswing in coho stocks. And so right now that season as set has a minimal opportunity in area nine. I would really like to encourage you to go back to that July 16th time frame in area nine, just to provide a fair opportunity to harvest what's on the table for the recreational fishermen of the North Sound. Thanks, Tom. And our next hand is from Zachary. I have allowed you to unmute yourself. Yeah, hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we gotcha. can hear you. Yeah, so I actually want to talk on, you know, just sort of the similar thing is that, you know, given the choice between we have, like you have here, the Marine Area 10, July 16th, and Marine Area 9, August 1st, I mean, they're very close and anglers can really easily get between one and the other. And last year, you know, I got out of work late in the opener. So I went and fished area 10 to the open the same day. And the creel for area 10, especially the first day of the open, the second day was just brutal. I mean, there's no fish. July 16th, Marine Area 10, the Kings aren't in yet. And so what were we doing is we were kind of beating up on shakers because that's the only thing that was there for all the boats. And everyone that went up to Marine Area 9 had a freaking blast because that's where all the fish are. And I think that by August 1st, that had really, we really reached a point where there were fish in both areas. And it let people have opportunity, but just making it wait till August in Marine Area 9, as you know, Tom said earlier, like the fish are, you know, a lot of the fish have gone through there by then. Um, and yeah, I would really encourage them to open at the same time to sort of just make sure that one, you don't get quite as much crowding. And, you know, if, if that's, you know, a trade-off you have to make, then open Marine Area 9 uh, that middle of July, uh, July 16th, and then open Marine Area 10 you know, later, obviously, I don't know the specific stock impacts from those two things. But given the choice of where to fish in the end of July, I mean, area nine is just it's, it's a fishery worth doing, whereas marine area 10 in late July is pretty uh, tough. 
So if it, if uh, if Zach and maybe if Tom's still listening, I, I might just uh, uh, pose a question at, at both of you. Uh, really appreciate your ideas. I guess I'm just thinking about our, our overall Chinook package and how we can think about shaping it. Uh, I also know that that uh, as Tom mentioned, you know, coho uh, coho fisheries are really important to a lot of people in in Central Sound, especially Area Nine. You know, there's a lot of uh, really good beach access points in Area Nine where people are able to, without a boat, are able to access coho uh, in that marine environment. So that's one of the cool things that I really like about that fishery. So, I mean, the, the question that I wanted to pose to you guys and that I'm really interested in, you know, more broadly from folks is, um, at, uh, you know, we, all, we have a lot of choices to make or not a lot of choices to make about um, those Chinook impacts and where we spend them. You know, the, uh, we're really limited on Stiligwamish and where those occur. So as we move past like into September for coho opportunity, we still have some kind of non-retention impacts uh, for Chinook. And, and I guess the question that I'm trying to get at is, um, is a July 16th opener worth having to shave the back end of September for coho because we don't have enough Chinook impacts to keep it open that long? Uh, one thing I would sort of say on that, first of all, is maybe, you know, not necessarily for this year, but one thing you talked about right there is just sort of how Marine Area 9 is special for Coho because of that beach access. And, you know, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I have to imagine that when you look at anglers fishing from a beach, their, their Chinook catch is very, very limited. And so I would, you know, if any at all, you know, we're going to be talking a couple of fish a year. And so I would really encourage sort of consideration for like, if, you know, we say this is an important fishery to have, perhaps like we have for the, you know, the fishing piers, like a you know, beach season, it goes and extends longer, sort of give an opportunity for that, if at all possible, because that's sort of a, I think a really, you know, powerful way to, you know, do it. And I know there is some history of doing it like in the Columbia of like bank only areas. And there are some other things where, you know, it has been done. Um, and I think the other thing about Coho from a boat is that Marine Area 10, we do have that October and that is a really good time. Um, and just that that second half of July in Marine Area 9 is really special. Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, Zach and um, uh, I, yeah, I'm thinking back to, I think it was 2017, 2018, at least in the recent past, when we've been really limited on coho, we have tried to carve out some of those uh, kind of niche uh, beach opportunities when we, we, you know, we just didn't have marine area impacts to offer. So thanks for that. Really appreciate it. And I've seen a couple of hands go up and down. So if anybody's having a trouble raising their hand, just let us know in the chat. We can call on you. Uh, it looks like we have Tom's hand back up. Tom, I have allowed you to unmute. Thank you very much, Leah. Uh, so going to, to Mark's question, to Mark's point. Yes, there. I, I think the Area 9 fishery, from what I'm hearing and, and what I'm in talking to a lot of anglers, that that fishery is important enough to consider moving to July 16th. In, we have other areas that we could fish for coho. We've got liberalized seasons in, in 8182 this year where we didn't have an opportunity. We have, we have the previous uh, speaker was mentioning a, an October opportunity even in area 10. So there are other options. Whereas with the draconian closures we've, we've experienced in area seven, there's no other place to go for a Chinook opportunity in, in mid-July should this matrix as proposed right now move forward. Um, again, I, I asked for the, uh, for the quota number for Chinook in area nine, you're not able to provide that for me, but my, my, my question in asking it is, look, if we're managing area nine under a quota and we achieve the quota in area nine with the July 16th opener, we would then go to a Chinook non-retention and, and possibly maintain some coho opportunity through the rest of the month. Yep, I appreciate the feedback, Tom. This is, uh, this is exactly why we're here talking about it. So uh, heard you loud and clear. Thank you. And our next hand is from Norm. Norm, I have allowed you to unmute. Hi, this is Norm. How y'all doing? It's a brutal year. Um, I'm sorry. Um, okay, welcome, Norm. Oh, I'm glad to be here, as always. 
Uh, <clears throat> I would just like to, if we open area nine, August 1st, I agree with what Tom was talking about. And that is we will leave fish on the table. That first two weeks in that this, the last two weeks in July, my experience has been when we catch the majority of that quota. Um, and I guess that's all I, I, I want to make a comment on. Thank you. Thanks, Norm. And our next hand is from Gabe. Gabe, I have allowed you to unmute. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I just wanted to support what Norm and Tom said. I think it's really important for uh, the fishing community and the sport fishing industry to have that July 16th opener uh, with the other areas that'll be open at that time. I think it uh, helps put us in a position where we're not potentially blowing through quotas as fast in other areas. So I'm supportive of a July 16th opener in area nine. If we burn through the quota really fast, we just save a few Chinook impacts so we can run that coho season. Thanks. Okay, and that was our last hand again. To remind those on the phone, uh, star nine to raise your hand. And if you're looking for it on your computer screen, it might be under the uh, reactions tab. Oh, and we have Norm with his hand up. Norm, I have allowed you to unmute. That, that if the cost is too high for that, Area nine opener, July 16th. Is there a possibility of moving it back to the last week of July so we still have some of that July time left? I mean, that's not the perfect solution, but is it possible? Thanks, Norm. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, remind folks that um, uh, we do have a, a, a modeling uh, tool that one of our, our FRAM modelers uh, developed. It probably doesn't have, uh, we haven't updated it with the most current modeling. Um, so I, I think the, the point that I may want to make, Norm, is, is anything's possible. Um, all the decision making that we do uh, around seasons together uh, you know, there's trade-offs for decisions, right? So, uh, you know, uh, for instance, I think folks are seeing uh, the decision to, to try to shape some additional winter opportunity in, in other areas and, and maintain as much as we could. Uh, it just, uh, any change from year to year causes some, some different decisions on seasons. And all that's going to be determined in any given year by the predicted abundances coming back and, and kind of how that relates to the management objectives that we're trying to achieve. So I would say that, yep, the, the July uh, opener is entirely possible, and it's something that we'll uh, get with the modeling staff and, and kind of model those things out as a choice and, and, and try to... Uh, uh, understand how that fits in the bigger picture of the fisheries that we're trying to put on the water together uh, throughout Puget Sound. Um, but again, I, you know, uh, every choice has, ha or, you know, kind of every action has a, a, a reaction. And the way I've tried to describe it in the past or the way that I think about it is in any given year, we have a, a pie of impacts that we're able to use to prosecute fisheries. And anytime we make a pie bigger or smaller, the rest of the pie pieces have to be adjusted to, in order to make everything work. So again, I, it's totally a possibility. I hear, I hear lots of feedback that people prefer that area nine mid-July opportunity. So that's, you know, that's on the table for us to consider. Thank you. Thank you. And it looks like in the chat, we have a question from Dave DeWald. Dave, I have allowed you to unmute if you would like to ask your question live. Hello? 
Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, just really quick. Can someone just uh, explain to me why uh, Area 6 has lost its October and then uh, getting back to the winter black mouth? And uh, if there's any, any foreseeable uh, fishing opportunities at those times down the road. So thanks, Dave. I think the, I'll tackle the coho question first. Uh, really, uh, since 2015, uh, uh, we had a really uh, big downturn in, in coho stocks since 2015. I would say this year's the first year that we've actually seen a rebound to, to somewhat what the old normal uh, kind of run sizes expected back were. Um, uh, I think if we're looking at recent years, people are saying, well, this is actually a really good coho year. But if we're looking kind of at the long-term averages, it's more around what we would expect in any kind of quote unquote normal year. I think there's several uh, wild stocks in Puget Sound that have limited those straits fisheries, including uh, you know the wild stocks on the Strait of Juan de Fuca in those northern northern shore tributaries. You know, we we group them all together in kind of eastern straits and western strait stocks, but uh, those have been in an overfished status uh, since 2016, I believe. Uh, and we haven't seen them even rebound to, to get into that rebuilding status. Uh, similar on the Snohomish stock, uh, uh, we've, uh, that one was hit pretty hard in 2015, and uh, it's taken a while to get out of the rebuilding status. We're actually, last year we had a really great return there and um, uh, almost 100,000 fish. And we're, uh, uh, although this year's preseason forecast is below what we need for an escapement goal, if we try to maximize it this year, it's possible that we could get out of that overfish status. So this is a long way of just saying we've had some really significant wild coho concerns in the recent past that have really limited those uh, uh, recreational fisheries on, on natural fish. Uh, really, the, the central sound areas is where we've uh, kind of maximized those opportunities on wild fish. That's where we see the, the highest mark rates and the lowest impacts on the stocks of, of concern there. Um, the, the winter opportunity is a little more complicated, but it feeds into what we were just talking about, about uh, Chinook impacts and, and kind of the, the, the piece of the impact pie that we have. We used to have uh, much broader kind of winter opportunities for blackmouth, but as the, the available impacts uh, primarily on Stiligwamish have shrunk in recent years, um, uh, most of our anglers have prioritized uh, summer fishing opportunities over winter. So, uh, you know, as those uh, pie pieces get smaller for winter, uh, we've been able to maintain that summer opportunity uh, at the expense of those winter opportunities. So hopefully that's a, a long way of answering your question there. Thank you. And our next hand is from Kurt. Kurt, I have allowed you to unmute yourself. Thank you, I've got a couple of questions. Mark, you mentioned earlier that the, the seasons as proposed here, we're still over the target impacts on one or more stocks. Correct. How big of a hole are we still looking at? Well, um, uh, it's a pretty big hole if we're looking at all of the co-manager fisheries combined, Kurt. Um, and uh, I think uh, as, we, as we think about these things, we're trying to, to look at things from the state fisheries perspectives. Sure. I, th I think we've, we've uh, uh, and we've had discussions at previous meetings about uh, basically a total number of unmarked mortalities out of the Stiligwamish uh, in recent years, we've done a 50-50 sharing with the co-managers on that, and that is our intention to, to split that this year as well. Um, so I think, and hopefully Kirsten or others on the call remember, I think uh, our target for that in this first round of modeling was about 73 or 74 uh, unmarked mortalities. Um, uh, in the most recent modeling, we think that we need to get it down somewhere between 67 to 69 mortalities in the final model run. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're still thinking we're going to need to do some shaping here uh, to try to make sure that we're getting in there. 
Um, that the current modeling does include uh, a couple of impacts for both a, a game fish season and a coho season uh, on the Stilaguamish. So um, uh, I know both of those are, are important uh, fisheries for those constituents. So uh, just like last year, uh, we'll be talking about all those as we move through the preseason. And, and we'll we'll talk about the game fish seasons at the at the Mill Creek meeting or that 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 meeting that used to be the Mill Creek meeting. But I just wanted to you know make sure folks understood that there is significant shaping to be done, and in the the final package probably will not look like what we're looking at on the screen right now. And and we need to go through it and it'd be nice. You know, you guys have done this long enough. You have a pretty good idea where people are going to come from, and you know, it'd be. Uh, on the meetings next week to have in your pocket what the, the total Chinook catches will be under the very options would be pretty, pretty helpful to uh, facilitate the discussions and making those decisions. And, and, and thank you. something I've thought about in the Chinook catches, is there any value in looking at just what the catches of uh, Puget Sound hatchery fish will be? I mean, a big thing that people always worry about is the uh, dividing of the hatchery Chinook catches between the two groups. And, and you know, we're just, we just talk about what the total Chinook catches and, would be and and you know I don't know if, how many people would be interested but that might be a, a, a metric that some folks might be find of interest and uh, uh, and finally ahead. I think we're getting to the time on some of these on these co situations that having access to information on what the wild coho stock uh, compositions are in in the various marine areas by month or something might be of value I mean and unfortunately those guys wander around all over God's creation. And, you know, as I recall, it was 2019 in, in June, you had quite a few, you know, North Sound fish in that marine area 10 um, fishery. And, and, you know, to, to really, if we're talking about, you know, some stocks are, you know, that are limiting fisheries, we probably need to know where they are and when, you know, and when they were there. I don't want to make this process more complicated than it has been, but unfortunately, I think the fish are driving us in that direction. Thank you. No problem, Kurt. Thank you uh, for your comments. And I would uh, just to respond, I, um, we're, we're probably not going to have those details for the Monday evening meeting uh, that you talked about, about those impacts. But that is our intention for the Wednesday uh, public meeting, the North of Falcon 2 meeting. Uh, we're going to spend as much time as we need to that day. Uh, uh, basically, folks have staff uh, and we'll have modeling staff on the line. And um, I think as part of uh, the modeling staff's uh, presentation and tools, uh, the, the total uh, catch um, is part of that discussion. I think Derek's built in that into some of the, the modeling tools for that we're evaluating the, the effects of the different fisheries uh, options and, and what that does for the catch. So yeah, I'm, I'm sure everyone is burning the midnight oil in a big way. Um, it just the, the more we can define what the, how big these problems are and, and how the better the groundwork is laid for the discussions prior to Wednesday, the, the more productive we will use our collect, you know, years and our times. And thanks again. Appreciate that, Kurt. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry, Mark. And next hand is from Bob, Bob, I have allowed you to unmute. Yeah, I just wanted to touch base back with James and Jenny real quick on that summer coho fishery. Um, you know, it's a pretty unique fishery when a summer coho, right? My understanding is they're kind of a different genetic strain than our fall fish and everything. So being that's the case, if we go back in history, you know, we were never really closed for those. They were just always open. They weren't really kind of... I don't know, they were just kind of like shoved off to the side, not really worried about as much. And now we're taking a little bit more concern into them. So my question, I guess, is, is we looking at this and we're trying to tighten that up and trying to get our escape numbers and being because it's a diff different genetic strain and really kind of a unique fish to the coastline and, and so forth. How much stock are we putting into that as we're managing um, our ocean fisheries? And what kind of play do they have on this particular stock? Because, um, you know, if we're if we're not taking that stock into consideration in our ocean fisheries, we may never get it back to where we want it to even allow us to have our our fishery in there and so forth down the road. Yeah, thanks, Bob. I'll just say so. The ocean piece of it's pretty complex, and there's folks on the call that know a lot more about it than me. 
But for the ocean piece of it, um, we do have the, the ability to model impacts to summer coho in ocean fisheries, and we know that they're low. And the reason we know that, or the reason that is, is, um, is because they're unique, like you highlighted. Their migration timing is a little bit different than the, the fall coho and those, those species that the, the non-terminal fisheries are directed at. So that's good for a summer coho. Most of the impacts are occurring in the terminal area. In terms of their uniqueness, just so if folks don't know about this run, um, you know, to have numbers in the two to 3,000 range, uh, you know, is, is a place we've been historically. That, and now we're looking at numbers in the three to 300 to 1,000 range. Um, so a little bit different there. Other thing about summer coho is they're the only one that we know of on the globe. Um, so this is an extremely unique population. And when we look at these unique runs like spring Chinook, summer coho, winter chum, you just start thinking of these. Um, and we know that they're having trouble, you know, summer steelhead. So this is one we're watching close. Uh, we can keep track of it in ocean fisheries. The tribes can watch it. Um, and then the other one last thing I'd say is if you go to the sold out cascades, if you even Google it, you'll see people from all over the world go to the sold out cascades to watch coho jump the falls. Those are the summer coho that we're talking about. So when there's, you know, 300 fish or like last year, even less than that, um, folks notice. So it's one of these unique ones where all the way from the ocean to, you know, right there on the spawning grounds, there's a lot of people watching and uh, interested in us making sure we protect those. So. Thanks, Bob, for all that, um, giving me the opportunity to talk about those. Appreciate it, thanks. I'm sorry, I had a weird mute situation just happened there. And next hand is from Zachary. Zach, I have allowed you to unmute yourself. Hey, sorry, I'll try and keep this quick. I don't want to dominate, um, but it seemed like the hands were slowing down. So I just sort of want to talk about sort of like the, you know, we talk a lot about like, you know, with a lot of people giving input saying like time on the water is really valuable. And it's just like, you know, maximizing the number of, you know, months you can go out and fish and, you know, just openings in general. And I think that sort of, you know, after that, we come with people just, you know, want to sort of maximize harvest, you'll know, get the most bang for your buck, you know, whether it's with stilly impacts or something. And I just think, with, you know, we've heard that a lot from the public, um, you know, even just tonight, we've heard both of those things. And I think that, you know, looking at this, you know, what's on the screen right now, what really stands out to me is, uh, you know, that Marine Area 7 marks selective fishery in the summer. And I know I'm going to get a lot of hate from this. I love my, you know, San Juan's fishermen. They are a very vocal group and we need that passion everywhere. But if you switch that fishery to a mark, so this is just the numbers are off of the little uh, stock analysis tool that you guys published. If you switch that period to a mark selective fishery, you end up you end up saving about 22 still Aguamish impacts. And that is at a cost of about 3000 fish harvested um, without changing the number of uh, days on the water whatsoever. And with those you know, 20 impacts, you can do so much more um, for instance, you can add that Marine Area 9, you know, opener, which adds, which only costs six fish, but catches 4,000 alone. So you're already net 1,000 fish. Um, you can add the Marine Area 6 winter fishery, as was discussed earlier. You can add the uh, Marine Area 8 winter fishery. You can extend the Marine Area 7 winter, the Marine Area 7 winter fishery, all of which, you know, greatly increases the number of days on the water with good chances at fists. And you know, even after adding all of those together, you still have room for what we said to you know dig out of this hole, you know, and come down. And so I just want to you know really you know encourage us to think long and hard about whether it's necessary to have that be a mark selective fishery instead of a non retention fishery. Thanks, Zach. And uh, you know, uh, I think you keyed in on to something that uh, we've been um, sharing with folks and is just a, a reality is that the, the model that we use for management, the, the FRAM model, um, 
uh, as part of that evaluation, there's a lot of still, still the Guamish impacts both in the summer and winter fisheries in area seven. All that, that model is based on coated wire tag recoveries from all those years of, of fishing in the, the late uh, kind of early 2000s and mid 2000s uh, when we expanded Mark Selective Fishery and had kind of wide open seasons, we use all that tag data to inform our management model today. And, and that's, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why there's a large representation of still the Guamish in there. The, the reality of it, uh, Zachary, is that um, there's not really a whole lot of modeled savings by going from a mark selective fishery to a non-retention fishery, because really all you're releasing is, is hatchery fish. Right, so you're not really saving much on those those wild or natural still the Guamish impacts. So that's why we would prefer that if if anglers are you know we want to be able to provide that coho opportunity, some fishing opportunity for the San Juan anglers. That's where that that mid August to late September period comes in. But the reality is is if if folks get a hatchery fish during that that time period, we, we want to allow them the opportunity to keep it and, and going non-retention uh, really isn't saving much on the, those still Guamish impacts. So. Okay. You know, that makes sense. But I just, that makes sense hearing that, you know, and logically, but I just, then why in that model is that, that if you select the uh, mark selective fishery in the second half of August and September, um, add 12.3 impacts. And if you instead switch to the coho directed fishery, um, it ends up to the coho directed Chinook non retention. It ends up being ten fewer than uh, is the base case. Um, I'm just sort of because I'm hearing you and what you say makes complete sense, but I just don't understand sort of where those numbers in the model come from because that sure looks like a swing of 22 fish. And and all I would say is I wish we had a modeler on tonight, Zachary. But like, if you want to stick your email in the chat, uh, we can follow up with the modeling staff and 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 make sure that you get that information so so you understand it. I uh, apologies, I don't uh, have that level of knowledge of what went into Derek's tool to be able to to speak definitively to that. Um, and be able, like I, uh, I'm not just uh, blowing smoke at you uh, to try to answer your question. So, uh, if that's amenable to you, we'll totally do a follow up with you and make sure that we're we're uh, getting that question answered. Appreciate it. Sounds good. And our next hand is from Kurt. Kurt, I have allowed you to unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, with the still Guamish Chinook, but aren't we also limited by the number of hatchery fish we can catch? And I, I don't know what your model is showing us whether you know we're up against it on on wild impacts or, or um, hatchery impacts, but you know you're looking at a five percent difference. And to catch a twenty four inch hatchery still guamish three year old hatchery still guamish fishery in the summer or even the winter, you can keep it. And that's hundred percent mortality. And if you release it, it's only a fifteen percent mortality. So I can see some scenarios where you know non retention um, might buy you a little bit on on the still guamish chinook just because of the absolute need for conservation, uh, that counter conservation program to get fish on the spawning grounds. It, it's what makes that whole thing so friggin' complicated and hard to deal with. And, and, and while I was looking here, I was looking at the proposed Chinook season, it, it does stand out that there's two areas that has no opportunity at Chinooks, and just, just an observation. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. And that was our last hand. So let's find anybody needs a repeat or a reminder, a uh, star nine to raise your hand on a cell phone um, and or under the reactions tab at the bottom of your screen. Kirsten, uh, would you mind maybe just throwing the calendar back up on the screen there? Um, so uh, maybe I can quickly answer Kurt's question. Uh, so far in the preseason modeling, uh, our impact rate on the hatchery stock for still the Guamish is 14%, and we're, uh, we're not anywhere close uh, to that impact rate with our current fisheries package. So uh, I don't think that will be a limiter in our preseason planning this year uh, to directly answer that question. Um, so. Uh, I'll just talk for a few minutes here about what's upcoming, just so folks know 
um, and and we'll uh, see if anybody else has, if that piques any other questions from folks. So as we talked about next Monday, uh, we're gonna have another recreational discussion uh, around these rec seasons for proposed for Puget Sound, as well as other freshwater areas, uh, primarily in kind of the North, Central and South Puget Sound. Uh, we did focus a little bit on, on Hood Canal and the coast here today. Uh, as I also stated, starting on Tuesday, we'll have some meetings in the afternoon with co-managers. We'll have a public meeting on Wednesday with folks. Uh, uh, check me someone on, uh, on my team. Uh, I think it starts at nine um, on, on Wednesday morning. Uh, again, that will be recorded and available for folks who aren't able to attend. Uh, and then Thursday, uh, we'll be back with co-managers. Uh, next week uh, to finish off our discussions there. Uh, following that, uh, on the 1st, uh, there'll be a Columbia River and Ocean Fisheries North of Falcon meeting. Uh, and again, just a reminder to folks, all these will be virtual this year still. Uh, the 5th and the 6th, Willapaw and Grace Harbor uh, Fisheries discussions as we head into the final Pacific Fishery Management Council meetings uh, from the 7th through the 13th. Uh, as I stated, they'll all be virtual and those meetings from uh, PFMC in that week, we will also plan a, uh, a morning Zoom call uh, to give folks an update uh, from those meetings on any uh, fisheries changes, proposed fisheries changes, uh, and if we need to do additional shaping as we head into the final discussions and fisheries shaping for 2022-23 fisheries. So again, look for those links on our website. Uh, they'll be there. Feel free to join us. Those morning meetings from the 7th through the 13th will uh, occur, I believe, at 8 o'clock in the morning following uh, a delegation meeting uh, as part of the council process. Uh, we'll be on for about an hour every morning from PFMC to just do a quick run through for folks and answer questions and have discussions about uh, ongoing discussions uh, 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 on all the, the salmon fisheries for 22 and 23. And sure enough, I, I talked long enough. It, it seems like we have somebody else with their hand up. So go ahead, Leah. Ed, I have allowed you to unmute yourself. I got a weird one here. Um, I don't know if it's part of this or, or not. So forgive me if I'm, but when the, the ocean fisheries open up and stuff like that, why aren't the guides required or given a certain quota, just like say the gill netters or any other commercial guy? So uh, ocean fisheries are managed a little bit differently than we do inside. Uh, all the ocean fisheries are, are kind of crafted and guided by the, the, the ocean fishery management plan. Uh, there's some, some uh, specific ways that they split the catches between the ports out on the coast from uh, Iwako up to Nia Bay. Um, and so those quota levels are guided and managed pretty intensively in season. Uh, obviously, uh, their, their aims for ocean fisheries are just like ours on the inside. Um, they're, they're trying to get full seasons and manage those full seasons. So, uh, you know, they keep track of both the, the charter catch and the private boat catch uh, throughout the coast uh, and make sure uh, that everybody gets those opportunities as we go through. Yeah, I'd just like to see you know, more toolies get through, basically. Yep, and and those con discussions will be ongoing. You see the the uh, April first meeting there. That'll be uh, probably a, a very uh, um, ongoing topic of discussion, especially at that meeting, as okay. the coastal fisheries and the Columbia River fisheries look to share those Thule impacts um, as they're both trying to craft seasons there. So, excellent. Hey, thank you. My pleasure. And that was the only hand for now. Well, I'll talk. Uh, Norm has his oh, hand up. Norm has a, oh, Norm put his hand back down. Let me unmute Norm and see if. Norm, do you still have a question or have something yeah, to say? Well, it, it's completely off base here. But the um, gentleman was just talking about the ocean. Um, 
we didn't have access last year at Nia Bay. I know we're talking about fisheries, not access. But will there be some discussions about trying to reestablish access to those area four fisheries? Or is that beyond your purview, Mark? So uh, good news, bad news, Norm. So I, I believe uh, I'm right when I say that uh, uh, the, the tribal council for uh, the Macaw tribe has put out a notice that I believe they're opening the reservation in the near future if it's not already open. Uh, so I think the, the, from what I have heard or what I understand the plan to be is that they're going to open the reservation at least through April and, and reevaluate that before the halibut openers that are planned for early May. I think they're going to try to open it for bottom fish fishers, uh, see how, you know, um, how things are going and, and try to just be cautious and reevaluate, um, um, but I know, uh, at least I think that's the plan for the for the near term is to try to open the reservation, uh, see how things go and and keep it open as long as they they can. Thank you very much, Mark. I, I appreciate that information. Uh, obviously, it's something that affects us too, as we're trying to think about how we uh, we sample and monitor those fisheries. The last couple of years, we've uh, we've uh, allowed, uh, for instance, our troll fleet to land, uh, uh, you know, either in CQ or farther west into Port Angeles. Um, uh, and so, yeah, it's something that we keep an eye on uh, and make sure that we're trying to track those things. So thanks for bringing it up, Norm. I did notice that uh, uh, Ty Garber, our Mark Selective Fisheries Biologist, put a link in the chat there um, for folks who are, who are interested in, in uh, the kind of the most up-to-date information there for, for the North Coast. So... Uh, Oh, go ahead, Leah. Nope, sorry, I was just gonna turn it back over to you and to let everybody know that the presentation is now posted online. Yep, appreciate that. So this uh, this presentation is posted online uh, and uh, we're gonna be updating the website tomorrow with some other uh, uh, kind of modeling and preseason related uh, fishery materials, including uh, proposed freshwater seasons for folks. Uh, just a reminder, we also have a, a public comment portal on our website where folks can provide written comment uh, about proposed seasons. Uh, we do take that into consideration. It, it is part of our, our rulemaking record that we use each year to set salmon seasons. So just know that uh, we do take both uh, written and verbal comment into consideration as we're, as we're crafting these opportunities. So just once again, uh, thanks to, to Kirsten and James and Jenny and, and Mark Downen uh, from the department, really, and Leah especially. Uh, really appreciate everybody's time and efforts tonight uh, and being here for the meeting. Uh, we appreciate uh, all of you taking time out of your day to join us and provide comment uh, and ask questions. Uh, uh, really appreciate that as well. Uh, with that, uh, uh, again, the, the huge thanks, and we look forward to seeing folks through the rest of the process. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, everyone.